Hello and welcome everyone to our video lecture on applied process mining. My name is Angela and together with my colleague Anne, we will be guiding you through this lecture today. Hi everyone, warm well, welcome also from my side and welcome to our lecture today on applied an applied introduction to process mining. Before we get started with the actual topics of today's lecture, um, we want to quickly introduce ourselves. So maybe Anne, do you want to get started with a short introduction of who you are and who we are at the Academic Alliance? Yes, sure. So my name is Anne and I'm an Academic Alliance Manager at Salonis. Um, within our team at the Academic Alliance, we are responsible for the academic partner management. It means that we work together closely with teachers, researchers, and students all over the globe to really bring process mining as new technology into the classrooms and enable and educate the workforce of tomorrow. And as part of our job as Academic Alliance Managers, we also educate students about process mining and execution management. And this is also our idea for this lecture today. But before we get started with the actual details about what process mining is about, how it works, um, we want to start by just giving you a brief insight into who we are at Salonas and how we started to, to be in the field of process mining technology. So we at Salonas started out as a student project of these three guys here that you can see on the third picture, Martin, Alex and Basti. The three of them were just students at the Technical University in Munich. And as part of their free time, they volunteered as consultants at Academy Consult. This is a Bavarian student consultancy which offers free consulting for companies and good opportunities for students to gain first work experience in return. So the three of them actually met over this project and they had the, the task to consult the Bavarian Broadcasting Service you can see them on the very first picture here. Um, the Bavarian Broadcasting Service is actually our biggest radio broadcasting service here in Bavaria. And their task was to consult the Bavarian Broadcasting Service on their IT service desk. The problem was that the IT service desk of the Bavarian Broadcasting Service took altogether five days to answer a ticket. So usually you can imagine when you would be writing a ticket to the IT service desk, this means you have some sort of IT problem. And you would wa rather want to get this IT problem fixed rather sooner than later. So what they did is they tried to do all of the traditional um, methods and techniques that consultants would typically apply to solving a problem like this. So they actually sat next to the service desk and watched them for a while. So they did some shadowing. They did interviews with employees. They pretended to be an employee submitting a ticket and so on. All of these things that you can do to get better insights into your process. The problem was that still after that, they didn't really know where the problem was and why it took the service desk so long to answer tickets. So what they came across back then was an academic idea that you could use data from IT systems, so data that is generated within companies on a daily basis to reconstruct business processes. Back then, this idea, which is now called process mining, was only an academic idea called workflow mining at the time. And it existed mainly on academic papers and in the form of algorithms, but not really in the form of a technology or software that companies could use right away. So what we came up with as a solution was to turn this into a software. And luckily the Bavarian Broadcasting Service now takes less than a day to answer a ticket. And we've had the idea to turn this into a technology that can be used by multiple enterprises worldwide. So what came from this was actually the idea to start our company here at Salonas. So we at Salonas have had around 100% of growth every year since then. And now we're over 2000 employees worldwide. And Maybe, Anne, do you want to share a little bit more about the history and how all of this came about at Salonas, how, we, um, how our journey looked like since then? Yes, sure. Because it really was a rocket ship that we have been entering in the last 10 years. So since the foundation of Salonas in 2011 um, by Alex, Basti and Martin back in the days as part of a student project, Salonas has really grown. 
First of all, with the global expansion into further areas in the world with our second headquarter opening in New York City, which also meant that the bigger focus of the company was also on the North American region. In 2018, we completely migrated from an on-premise solution to the so-called intelligent business cloud, meaning that all our customers had to migrate in within one year to our new cloud solution. In this year, it was also the same year that Gartner declared Salonis as the clear market leader in process mining. One year later, um, we um, established our Series C funding. And with this new Series C funding, we just announced a new round of 290 million US dollars coming in which was really a testament to the growth of the company, bringing Salonis to a total valuation of over 2.5 billion US dollars. In the last year, in 2020, Salonis established and launched its new execution management system. And as the name tells you, it's all about an intelligent process execution. With this completely new software category, comparable to ERP systems, CRM systems, Salonis was completely reinventing itself. With this, our Series D funding came along and Salonis announced its new funding round, collecting over 1 million US dollars. This increased the value of Salonis to over 11 billion US dollars, making it Germany's Europe's and New York's most valuable startup. And with this, not only the numbers count, but also the customers that stand behind them. Angela, maybe you want to give the students some more insights into which kind of customers alone is typically has. Yeah, and I think this is really the main reason why also students should be interested in learning about process mining technology, because as you can see here from this um, quick snapshot of some of the customers that use process mining technology, um, process mining is something that isn't just applicable to one industry or just applicable to one particular process or something like this. It's something that spans across industries, across different process dimensions. Essentially, every company that has a good digitization base so that has enough digitization to save data in the form of digital footprints um, is actually a good candidate to use process mining as part of their process optimization. And as you can see from this list here, um, it's a really wide array of um, companies from Siemens to Unilever to Coca-Cola <laughs> um, to Lufthansa or Airbus or Uber. Um, you can really see there's not just one niche that uses this technology, but it's something that's applicable across industries. Just a fun fact, in case you wonder how relevant process mining technology is nowadays, over 50% of Fortune 500 companies use process mining technology by now. So it's over half of Fortune 500 companies. And to our German speaking audience, in Germany, it's over one third of stock listed companies that also already use process mining technology. So you can see the bigger, the better. <laughs> and the customers that we, um, that we serve really are big players on the market. And it's interesting to see how we can change their operations um, with process mining technology. It's really crazy uh, to see yeah. how this customer base is actually growing. But it's not only customers that belong to this big network, right? It's also the ecosystem behind it. Absolutely. So there's a huge ecosystem of consultancies and technology companies that partner up with us to provide the solution to enterprises worldwide. So just looking at consultancies, there's over 1,500 consultancies that partner up with us. Among them are, for example, the big four or big players like, for example, um, Capgemini or so, or so on. There's also technology partners like Microsoft or um, ServiceNow, Blue Prism, which are also partners of ours. And there's this huge um, ecosystem of certified professionals, um, smaller providers within niche sometimes even for example providers within the healthcare um, world within the manufacturing world that partner up together with us to provide the solution specifically to their industry 
But as we said already, we're not, um, we're not just talking about industry partners here. Process mining as a technology um, comes from academia and has an academic DNA. So this also means that process mining is a field that's researched quite a lot. So maybe, Anne, you can just say a little bit about this and about the universities, which are also part of our ecosystem. Yes, definitely. And I'm really proud to say, actually, that we have over 900 academic partners worldwide. This is actually crazy to think about. 900 teachers, researchers worldwide use our software solution in their classes, in their own papers, research projects. And this really shows the big momentum that process mining as a technology, but at the same time as a software, really has. It has an impact on the academic world and at the industry, in the industry. And this is what we actually want to show you today. So for today, we've prepared um, a small outlook into what process mining is all about, starting from the theory um, behind the technology to the very, very applied use cases, like, for example, how process mining is used at Lufthansa. Um, we also want to show you the software itself. So we have a short demo planned um, as part of this session as well. Um, so hopefully you will be um, all excited about all of those contents and will stay with us for those contents. But maybe let's start right away with talking about why this technology is actually relevant. So we often call it the process challenge because processes are really at the heart of almost every business and are really quite important and quite crucial for business success long term. Well, maybe we can just spend a second to think about the challenges that companies face nowadays that are related to process challenges. So we just made this little list here of different challenges that keep companies busy nowadays. And among them are, for example, high customer expectations. So we have really, really um, a very competitive world with regard to, um, for example, delivery promises, quality promises, um, everything that's got to do with, with very good customer service. The expectations are quite high here on that end. We have shorter product cycles. Innovation cycles are also getting a lot shorter. We have challenges like mass customizations. We now try, try to offer products that on the one hand side, we can deliver to the doorstep the next day, but at the same time are tailored towards the needs of our customers. Just think about all of the products where you can order some sort of um, customized, I don't know, shoe or trainer or something like this, and it's still gonna be delivered to you the next day to your doorstep. That's a lot of challenges. It's individualization and still high-class service at the same time. And then at the same time, when we take a look at the challenges within the business, it's things like digital transformations taking place now more rapidly than ever, disruptive technologies coming into the market, automation technologies, for example, um, data collectors, um, all of those things really influencing our market nowadays. Um, and also the fact that we are globalizing, that our supply chains get more complex, more global, um, and also more digitized. So... As a company, it's not that not so, that easy to survive nowadays and to keep up with all of those challenges at a daily basis. So, well, it's obvious some of, some companies fail to keep up with those challenges, and this is usually what results in process inefficiencies. And I'm sure we've all experienced those process inefficiencies before. So, just really bad processes. Oh, and these challenges are all related to processes, of course. But yeah, I think we've all experienced those process inefficiencies in the past. We've all experienced really bad customer experiences as well. So maybe, and we can just take a second to brainstorm this a little get a bit together between the two of us. If you're sitting here watching this lecture, maybe you can brainstorm a little bit for yourself. Just think about the worst customer experiences that you've had in the last months. And I'm not sure, and do you have any examples of really bad customer experiences that you've experienced? Yes, I actually have a really bad one. Um, so I was actually ordering something um, for, for a friend's birthday online and they actually delivered it to my doorstep and they actually also wrote down that they delivered it and it has already arrived. However, I did not find it anywhere. So I did not accept it. And I thought, okay, maybe a neighbor has it. I looked, up, I looked it up um, in the mailbox, but there was nothing. So I actually texted this company again, hey, I did not receive my package, where is it? And I was really hanging in their hotline for one hour, which was like an awesome experience. Like 
listening to the same song over and over again um, to, to then finally telling me who was actually the neighbor that accepted the package. So yeah, this was really a really bad experience. And um, since then I also did not never order at that company again. Yeah, and when you think about it, it's actually just logistics processes that are behind this that have caused this really bad um, process experience. Maybe I could just share two examples that I've experienced um, recently. <laughs> so one of them is I just ordered new hiking shoes. They were supposed to arrive yesterday. They didn't. Um, and of course, I didn't receive a notification. So now I'm a little bit worried. Are they still going to arrive? Are they not going to arrive? Have I missed them? Um, it's little things like this where it's just, you know, it leaves the customer with a bit of insecurity. Now I'm a bit like, you know, have I just wasted 70 euros on hiking shoes that I will never yeah. get? Um, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> and I have another example as well. So recently I tried to open a bank account. Um, and actually what happened to me is I was, I felt almost like I was too stupid to open up this bank account because I didn't get the right credentials sent at the right time. Um, and that to me with, you know, like online banking and no customer service available that you can easily call was really bad because I wanted to log into my new bank account and I couldn't because I didn't have the credentials. So it's just tiny little things like this, which yeah. really influence customer service. But also, yeah. I think, yeah. But you're not the only one, Andrew, with that. Actually, because I think the problem behind it is that the, uh, the, the whole online banking thing, it's digitalized, but part of it is still very, very manually done. So that's why you have these kinds of inefficiencies in the process of opening your bank account. And I actually experienced the exact same thing. So I feel you. Okay, well, that's good to know. And hopefully some of the people in the audience can also feel us because then you know what it's like to have really bad processes at a company. And this is what we want to talk about today. So. Process inefficiencies are almost everywhere and processes really drive customer satisfaction and they also drive efficiency at companies. So let's just assume you've realized that your processes are just like the ones here in the picture with long waiting lines, unsatisfied customers, delays, and so on and so on. Um, there are a few methods that you can use to get insights into those processes. So let's just spend some time talking about those methods. What would you traditionally do to get insights into, um, into your business, into your processes. Okay. One of the very first things that companies often try to do is they try to look at some sort of process documentation first. So process documentation in that case means maybe at some point you've written down an ideal model of what your customer service process or maybe your purchasing process could look like at your company. Maybe you've also written down some guidelines. So those guidelines can be there, for example, to train new employees to tell them what your um, purchasing looks like, what your customer service look like. Maybe you have any documentations like this that you can use as a first point of contact to get insights into, into your business. Now, maybe Anne, you can help me a little with this. Um, obviously those process documentations are great to get first insights. Um, there's downside to them, right? <laughs> yeah. So the problem with those process documentations is that they don't really portray what is happening in real life. So we always just have them on paper. We have to process how it should be, but not really how the employees, the customers behave in the real world. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, we actually need a method that gives us more insights into how the actual process looks like. And this is also what consultants do most of the time. So this is usually the point where you would start any sort of manual investigations. Um, manual investigations could be anything like interviews with employees, with experts from the field, from your company, um, even uh, interviews with customers maybe. Um, also all of those traditional consulting techniques, like for example, having focus groups, getting together workshops for people to discuss things, to, um, to brainstorm things together shadowing the department that's also an option or even pretending to be a customer um, who would submit a ticket for example who would be entering into this customer service and just seeing what happens to share a little bit of my own experience with this i used to be an intern as at a bigger strategy consultancy and this is actually part of what they made me do they made me pretend to be a customer at our customers just to see what their customer service would look like now Obviously, there's also a downside to this one. I mean, what's great about this is that it helps you to get better insights into what really happens. It's more realistic. You're closer to reality. 
but still the insights that you get are quite fractional. So you only get partial insights into what's really happening. And um, at the same time, you have to deal with a lot of biases. You have subjective biases. When you speak to employees, for example, they will only tell you, you their version of the story. You have observer's biases. When you shadow the department, for example, people might behave differently than they normally would. Now, that leads us to think we want to have a more objective way of analyzing those processes. So one of the very next things that people will do is they will try to look at KPIs. And the kind of KPIs that we can find at first glance are usually KPIs like throughput times, profits, losses, net promoter scores, and so on. And again, these KPIs are great for spotting patterns, for also getting a more objective view of your process. But it's a little bit but like just um, looking at the surface of what really happens. It's like finding a symptom, but not really understanding the root cause or the illness behind this. So those KPIs are great to get a first insight, again, to spot patterns, to know where you should be looking more closely, but they don't really tell you the story behind them. So of course, all of this is meant to be a big pitch for you to make you think, wait a second, we need something different. We need a data-driven approach to solve these process problems. And that is exactly what process mining does in the end. Process mining is an approach that uses data science to look at business process problems. Let's dive a little bit into what process mining really is about and how process mining theory works. Process mining, again, looks at business processes. So with process mining, we look at all of those typical business processes that we can just define as, you know, a series of linked activities or steps that in the end lead to a particular product or service. So anything that we can sequence out like this, that we can classify this, we can look at with process mining. And what process mining really does is process mining tries to create this missing link between process science on the one hand side, so all of the typical questions that executive management might ask themselves, that a consultant might ask himself. Um, but this time we try to combine this not with those traditional methods, but with a more data-driven approach. So we try to use data science to solve these problems and all of the techniques that we already know from data science, like for example, data mining, statistics techniques, or even machine learning and prediction. So we also brought this nice little definition to you. Um, so what process mining really is, is process mining lies at the intersection between process science on the one hand side and data science on the other side. And it bridges the gap between what we call uh, model-based process analytics. So the kind of analytics you would do to get better insights into your process, to make some first assumptions about your process and data-centered analytics. So it's really bridging the gap between those two fields between a model-based approach and a data-driven approach and combining the typical management problems we might ask ourselves with data science techniques that we already know. And the really innovative part about this really is that for the longest time, all of these process science disciplines have been done completely assumption-based or experience-based. And process mining really provides completely new data science view on it. So this is really what makes process mining the newest, most innovative method that you can use also in combination with the few methods that Angela has um, explained before. Yeah, that's a very good insight to share, I think. And I think what also the students watching this shouldn't forget is that, you know, process mining is on the one hand side a technology nowadays that is used in industry, but it's also a research field that continuously keeps on developing. So this field here, as we see it here at the intersection of the two, is actually a field where lots of people research in, um, get new insights, create new insights on a daily basis. So it's really a field that keeps on developing as well. So Maybe let's dive a little bit further into, um, into how this really works. So process mining uses digital footprints, essentially, to reconstruct happenings in the real world. So let's assume we have interactions taking place in the real world, like, for example, invoices being paid, um, orders being made, complaints being placed, and so on and so on. And these interactions in the real world are usually supported by some sort of IT system in the background. And within those IT systems, we typically start to have a record of what's, ha what's, ha what's happening in there. So we have those IT systems supporting daily interactions on a daily basis and leaving digital footprints within them. 
Those digital footprints, we also call them event logs. So that's the data that we would look at. And we use them to reconstruct a digital version of what has happened, a so-called digital twin of an organization. If that's still a little abstract for you, here's how this works. So all of the information that we need to reconstruct the process, and you might remember this from the very start for us, a process is anything that can be sequenced out as you know, a clear sequence of activities that lead to a product or a service in the end. And um, all that we need in order to do this is the so-called event log information. An event log just consists of three pieces of information. All we need to know is who, what, and when. So first of all, we need to know who or what are we looking at? We need to have a case ID that we can follow throughout our IT systems. So this case ID here in this case, it's an order number, for example. In other cases, when we look, might be looking at accounting, it might be an invoice number. If we look at customer service, it might be a customer number. So first of all, we need to have a case ID that we can track throughout our systems. Second of all, we need to know what has happened. So we need to have activities associated to this case ID. Like, for example, has the order been created? Has the credit check been approved? Has a delivery been created? Have the goods been shipped? So that's the second thing that we need to know. And then thirdly, we need to know when did that take place? How can we sequence out those activities? So we need to have a timestamp sequencing out the activities. So just like this, I get back to this textbook definition of what a process is, only this time I can reconstruct it based on my data. So what you can see here is essentially we've reconstructed the digital trace of this case ID here. And within our IT systems, very often we don't just have one case ID that we would follow, but we have a couple of millions of case IDs. So it's really big data that we deal with here. And every one of those case IDs will have their own trace that we can reconstruct. So we can take a look at every single one of them in detail. However, of course, we're interested in the bigger picture. So we might be interested in starting to aggregate them. So what we can do is we can, for example, start to cluster them and find similarities. Like for example, case ID number one, two, and three, they might follow a specific sequence of activities like this variant here. So this specific sequence of activities, for example, receiving the order, then confirming the order, creating the delivery and shipping the goods, we might cluster that into one variant or one version of what this process can look like. There might also be alternative versions or variants of what this process looks like. For example, um, here in the second variant, it almost looks the same, but we have this extra activity called delivery block. So that's a bottleneck that we are experiencing here because for some reasons, reason the delivery can't be sent out. So with the second variant, case ID number four, five, and six might be affected. And just like this, we can start clustering out our millions of case IDs and turn them into variants and aggregate all of those variants to get some sort of process map, so some sort of model-based approach again, um, to um, reconstruct our whole process based on this. So maybe let's sum this up before we start looking at this directly in the software. What we start out with for our process, process mining journey, journey is we always start out with the data first. So in order to start our process mining journey, we need to have a data model first. This data model consists of our event log, who, what, and when, so case ID, activity, and timestamp. And in addition to my event log, I might also have additional master data about my process. So I might know for this case ID, who was the customer behind this, how high was the price, what was the customer satisfaction like, and so on and so on. So this master data is something I can use later on if I want to do, for example, some comparative process mining and compare factors influencing the process. I can use this later on for my investigations. Based on this data input that I have, I can use this to create some sort of process model of what this process looks like based on the data. Even though we're creating a model here, and this is sort of a model-based approach, the source of our model or where this model comes from is all database. So this is an as-is model of your process based on your as-is data. It's nothing that comes from assumption, assumptions, but it's what has happened in reality based on your data. And then if we are really a consultant or someone within our business working with this, we usually use this, of course, to start analyzing our process and also improving it. 
And this usually happens in three steps. We start with analyzing our process performance first. So this is part of our discovery process, analyzing the actual process, finding out what does the process look like. Then in the second step, we might start with some process conformance checking. So we might compare our as is process to maybe our to be wild from the process documentation uh, um, that we talked about earlier. Um, so we would be comparing as is and to be wild and see where the two of them deviate. And then last but not least, least we use this diagnosis that we've created, those insights that we've created to also improve the process long term. So really, in a nutshell, this is what process mining is all about. Um, but of course, we want to take a look at this in the software now. So, <laughs> Anne, do you want to take, uh, to, do you want to guide us through this in the software? Yeah. So let's have a look together into the execution management system. And for you students out there um, who have not created an account in the execution management system yet, um, we have a very exclusive academic license where you can create an account for you free of charge. For this, you can simply scan this QR code on the right hand side or use this link below. Register for free with your email address and you will receive an invitation email where you can complete your reg registration either as a student, a professor or a researcher. And afterwards, you should be ready to get started and explore your personal Salonis team. So in the next step, let's have a look at how the Salonis system, the execution management system is built up and then have a look at the different functionalities in there. So the execution management platform basically consists of three layers. Let's start with the bottom layer. It consists of multiple different systems that are already in place at most companies. For example, an Oracle system, ServiceNow system, Salesforce system that store millions or billions of data and of entries, of orders, of um, customer numbers. And all of these data get extracted and pushed into the execution management platform. And most of them even on a minute or a daily base, so really in real time. Based on this data extraction, in the next step, we can reconstruct our process as it really happened in the real world with the help of process mining, as well as task mining, which looks at all of it from a more granular base. Based on the process mining and task mining process model, we can really plan and simulate our process, how it should look like in the real life. A lot of companies, especially the, um, the managers and executive team also use the Salonis execution management system as their visual and daily management dashboard to really track their KPI and monitor them continuously. The next question would be, what do we actually do once we have reconstructed our process, analyzed it, and have identified problems? After that, of course, we also want to take actions to improve our process. And this is what we can do with the help of action flows, meaning that we can automate parts or even whole processes where we see that there has been a lot of manual repetition. Another feature that is not portrayed here because due to uh, the lack of space here is also our machine learning workbench, which we will also be seeing in the software in a bit, which enables us to really work on predictive process mining, meaning we can really anticipate what will go wrong in our process next and avoid mistakes before they even happen. And based on our vast experience throughout the last couple of years, throughout the last 10 years with over 2000 customer um, implementations, we can really bundle all of this knowledge, all of this experience and so-called execution apps. And those execution apps, they really work like plug and play solutions, just like from your Android store or from your Apple iStore, where you can simply download pre-configured apps 
for a specific system that you are using within your company and use this straight away. So now let's have a look into the execution management system. So I am right now at the sign up page of my personal academic team and you can recognize your own academic team in the URL bar. So it should usually start with academic minus your specific email address .eu2.salonus.cloud. Then put in your email address and your password and you should be able to sign in to your personal team. So the first thing that you should be able to see is the functionality business views. Business views is the view that at the end of the day, the specific department or an executive will have into their processes. In this business views functionality, we have also certain um, packages prepared for you. In the very first package, we have a welcome package where you can find further resources, um, further materials that you can use, as well as a small definition of what process mining is again and how to navigate within our software. As you can see, we also have further packages and package two to seven are all pre-configured analysis where we have already prepared the data as well as the analysis ready for you to use and analyze. But where are these analysis actually created? So these analysis are created in our so-called studio. And in the studio, you really have the functionality to create new analysis as well as to edit them. By simply clicking this button on the upper right hand side, edit, you can easily edit the KPIs as well as create your new KPIs by adding a component. For this, we also have a specific online training that you can do, um, which will teach you everything about um, the KPIs as well as the components that you can add to the dashboards. So you might ask yourself, where does the data come from? And this is what we do in the so-called event collection. We collect events here in so-called data pools. So for me, I already have um, multiple data pools in here. But you would probably should quite empty, look quite empty. And here in here, you can actually um, do your data connection with your live system if you have one or upload flat files. In this academic license, however, we have only enabled flat file uploads because most of the time, students and teachers, of course, you don't have any live system running. So for uploading your uh, flat files, you can simply um, use the file upload section where you can really upload um, multiple kinds of, um, um, of formats from Excel files, CSV files, JSON, Parkwood files, you can really upload um, your data in here. And as you can see, I have already already upload, I have also already uploaded three tables in here, which all evolve around the pizza order process. Probably a process that every one of us has gone through at some certain point in time. And these three tables I have connected together to build our data model as Angela has just shown you in the theory, which is the very foundation for our analysis. And this analysis is then created in the studio, which we will look at in the business view section. So just as a short excursion here, you also have the machine learning workbench in your very own academic team. So if you're really into um, creating your own machine learning models, feel free to use this integrated Jupyter notebook, which enables you on the one hand side with your complete free um, notebook where you can create completely your own models, as well as with predefined apps, machine learning apps that we have already created for you that you can try to use on your own data. But now let's get back into the business views because now we actually want to look deeper into a specific process. And here we want to look into package number five, the order to cache process. 
So first of all, let's look a little bit deeper into what the order to cash process is all about. And for this, I have prepared a little overview for you, showing you one typical order to cash process, how it can actually look like. So order to cash process deals with everything from um, receiving a specific order for a product or a service, to sending the, the service or the product out to actually receiving the payment by the customer. And in a typical circumstance, how a process model in most companies would look like is that it starts with creating the order, confirming the order, creating the shipment, sending the goods, sending out the invoice, and finally receiving the payment by the customer. For this certain order to cash process, we normally have a huge order management order department involved. And this order management department also has specific business goals that they try to achieve. Maybe asking you, Angela, uh, what do you think? What are typical business goals that such an order management department might have? Well, thinking back to my worst customer experience, <laughs> um, I think one thing is also an on-time delivery. So being actually, or making sure that you can um, deliver your goods on time and then making sure you don't have any delivery blocks or similar on the way. <laughs> and as you just said, uh, you want to make the customer experience a really, really good process. So therefore one business objective would be a high customer satisfaction that you can achieve through on-time delivery, as well as a full delivery. So this could be one business goal, but of course, depending on the co um, company, um, you have several business objectives. In here, we have accumulated some of them for you. This could, for example, be the customer satisfaction that we've been talking about, but also, of course, revenue increases, the optimization of the working capital within the company, an increase of labor productivity, as well as to minimize the risk as much as possible. And all these business objectives, they need to be quantified in some certain kind of way. And this quantification happens through so-called key performance indicators or key metrics. For our customer satisfaction, this would be the so-called on-time in full rate, where we measure how many of our orders have arrived at Angela on time and in full, as well as, um, for example, for the revenue increase, we measure the conversion rate, the rejection rate and return rate. And for example, for the risk mitigation part, we measure here the number of SOD violations, so the separation of duty violations, or the percentage of expired contracts and invoices with error. So you can see we have a lot of different perspectives on when this process is categorized as successful. On the one hand side, from the order management department, where we want to improve our performance. And on the other hand side, also by the auditor that comes at the end of the year and sees whether we have conducted our process as we should have and tries to minimize the risk at to the, to the minimum point. So now let's have a look into the software and see how Salonis can actually help these different kinds of um, parties that are involved with the order to cash process to gain full transparency into their process to improve performance as well as compliance. And for this, you will be able to see in your package file within your software, this very first process over. Let's make it a little bit bigger and have a look at the process. In the middle here, you can see the reconstructed process based on the log data that we have extracted from the specific system. This log data actually stems from a real company provi kindly providing us with their data, of course, completely pseudo-randomized and anonymized. And this company is um, a company that sells products um, to other companies. So it's a B2B business model. And in total, in the last year, they had 988,000 sales order items or cases. These equal a net order value of 1.25 billion euros. 
And the process that we can see here exactly resembles those cases and sales order items. In the middle of it, we can really see the most common variant. So the variant that happens in the most sales order items. And here we can really see that the process starts with receiving the order, confirming the order, generating a delivery document, shipping the goods, sending out the invoice, and to finally clear the invoice to the process. So the little number that you can see in between is the number of cases or sales order items that run through this process variant in the exact same sequence. On the right hand side, you can see that, of course, there's not only one variant, but multiple variants, how this process can actually look like. So Angela, what do you guess? How many process variants for this order to cash process exist? On the right hand side, you can see that there is not only one variant, how this process can look like, but actually multiple variants. In fact, the first variant only covers 43% of all sales order items that we have here, meaning 404,000 cases. You can also see the duration from process start to process end of this very specific variant, which is 11.8 days. If you, want, if you want to have a closer insight how many days actually pass between specific activities, you can also have a look at, at it here by changing from case frequency to throughput time. Here you can actually see how long it takes between the specific activities and also see certain kinds of bottlenecks which are marked in violet here. So let's have a look at some further variants that exist here. By enlarging this window on the right hand side. And in here you can already tell all the deviations from the first process variant. And to really have an insight what's going on here, you can use process animation. This process animation shows us how the cases actually flow through the different process variants. And for example, in the second process variant, you can see that there was this additional activity called extend the confirmed delivery date. So Angela, what do you think? Does this additional in activity of extending the confirmed delivery date, does it have a positive or a negative impact on the business objectives that we have just looked at? Well, definitely a negative impact, I would guess, because extending the confirmed delivery date, that's the case I've talked about earlier. It's when you, you can't really make your delivery promises. So customer satisfaction is not great. Um, but also on the, uh, on the back end with your logistics, it means it might be holding up the process at another level as well. Exactly. So this definitely is an activity that we would like to avoid in our process. Now let's have a look at the further process variant, process variant number three and how it looks like. And here we can see that between receiving the order and confirming the order, we need to conduct a credit check and approve this credit check. Maybe asking the same question again, does this have a positive or a negative impact on our business objectives? What do you think? Well, just judging from the throughput times, I would say it's negative because now it takes us five days instead of otherwise one day. Is that right? <laughs> so just, ju just judging from the throughput times, this would be correct, of course. However, when we think back of the business objectives that we have, and one of it being the risk mitigation, of course, such a credit check could help us to avoid later on payment, um, uh, missing payments by customers. Oh, right. I didn't get that before. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> So therefore, a credit check would be something that is actually um, an activity that should not be missing in our process. And you can see that there are so many more variants. Of course, we don't have the time to look into all of them today, but you can see that in total, 85% um, of all cases are already covered by the first five most common variants. 
And in total, we actually have 495 different variants. And those 495 variants, um, if we look at them, we can easily see um, that they are so complex that something like this, in the academic terms, you call it spaghetti net, you would never actually come up with it as human. So this is only something that we can do completely data-based. But now let's have a look at the most common process variants again, and also have a closer look into the deviations that we already discovered and maybe find out which kinds of causes they have. And for this, we will jump into the overview section, which we can find at the bottom part next to process. And in this overview, next to the general variant explorer that we have already seen, we also have the sales order items and value by months, as well as further information about the customers and their orders, as well as about the materials that have been ordered. Here we can see that this company is selling materials of daily use, as well as sales organizations, plants, distribution channels, and so on. So all the master data or additional data that really give us context to our process. And in here, we can really have a closer look at an undesired process activity, like the extend confirmed delivery date that we had in our second process variant. So I, what I can do is that I can simply click on this activity and filter on all the cases or orders that have happened with this specific delivery date extension. And I can easily see that this happened for 170,000 of sales order items, equaling an amount of 246 million euros. Having a look at my distribution per month, I can see that it looked quite similar in most of the months, except for July 2018. So in the next step, I could investigate why was there such a peak in the month of July? I can filter on this again. And with this also scan through which customer, for example, was strongly impacted by that, where I can sort my table and see that, for example, my customer green industry was heavily impacted by these delays. Can also have a look at the material group that was involved with this. Can see that skincare products have been uh, ordered a lot in this month, as well as have a look through all the different kinds of uh, master data that I have in here. Where I also get, for example, to the distribution channel, where I can clearly see here something that is really odd. And this is that 99% of all my orders in this month that have been delayed were actually shipped or distributed by my Express One V1 Express channel. So the things that we have done through the filters right now, and quite intuitively, to be honest, and um, you can actually also do in a very automated way. So now let's delete the filters out of here and go into the conformance sheet. Thinking back about Angela's um, the theory lesson, what is the conformance check again? The conformance check is the comparison of the as is process, so the process that we have extracted from our log data, and it should be processed, so the process how it should look like. And for the system to be able to identify how the process should look like, we need to create a process model, which you can find here in the section view process model. So in here, for those of you who have worked with process models before, you can see a typical process model in business process modeling notation. You have three options how this could be created. This could be simply uploaded if you already have something like this in place. 
You can also create it yourself with the integrated Kamunda extension that we have here. Or what actually most customers from Salonis do is that they actually mine it from the as is process. Because oftentimes they don't really understand how their process looks like in real life. And therefore they use this specific insight to actually, just like we have done it, um, evaluate which of the activities are um, having a positive impact and which of the activities are having a negative impact on that process. And based on this, you have this should be process model that the system automatically compares to you with the as is process model. And the result of it is shown here in the statistics about conformance, where we can see that 59% of our orders cases are conformant with how the process should look like. This equals 590,000 cases, meaning that 400,000 cases are non-conforming cases. And these non-conforming cases go back to 40 violations in our process, which we can have a closer look at. And here we can find our activity of extending the confirmed delivery date again, of cancellations of orders, of the um, goods return, uh, of returning goods, sending payment reminders, and so on. So in the next step, we can also have a closer look at those violations by clicking on them and see, for example, which kinds of effects they have on our KPIs. In this case, instead of 90 days, we actually need 48 days for the total process. And an additional step that we can do is that we can perform a so-called root cause analysis. And in here, Salonis automatically calculates you the correlation between the master data and the undesired activity of extending the confirmed delivery date. And in here, we can see our V1 Express 1 distribution channel as the top root cause for this violation. So this was a little excursion into our software. Of course, you can see that there are so many more worksheets in here that you can explore, as well as so many more processes that we already pre-configured for you to explore. As well as, of course, use the chance to upload your own data for your student project or for your final thesis and make the most of the software. So now let's jump into the third chapter, process mining in application. For this, it is important for you to know how typical process mining projects are actually conducted. And a typical process mining project normally consists of four steps in the so-called CDEM cycle, the collect, discover, enhance, monitor cycle. So in the very first step, you collect the data that is needed, where you connect to your source systems, transform the data into those event blocks, and establish a real-time connection to the system. This is usually done by the IT department at a company who really have the overview of all the different systems and how to get access to them. In the next step, you discover your process based on the event logs. In this, uh, in this step, you visualize the process, understand root causes, and also prioritize on the impact that your findings have. This is usually done by a data analyst. This data analyst prepares the dashboards, just as we have just seen in software, for finally the business user in step three to be able to use. This business user is specifically from the department using this on a daily basis and really trying to improve the process on an, opera on an operational level. In this step, you try to, for example, um, take actions in your source systems by changing things to redesign your process model to optimize the actions and outcomes of your process and also to automate your tasks. Finally, in the fourth step, you really want to close this cycle of 
continuous process improvement with monitoring your key metrics all the time. This is mostly done by executives and managers where you can really benchmark your process continuously. This is the so-called comparative process mining that Angela mentioned before, where you can really analyze your process conformance, predict your performance um, outcomes, compliance, and um, your process performance. So to make this a little bit more vivid for you to really understand how this works in an actual company, we have brought the example of Lufthansa City Line. Lufthansa City Line is a full subsidiary of the Lufthansa AG with having with their flights to European capitals and regional cities with over 8 million passengers per year. And the hubs being here in Munich as well as at the Frankfurt Airport. So Lufthansa City Line is not a typical customer that we usually have. And so are their processes that we had to analyze. So the process that we looked deeper into was the so-called ground operations process. The ground operations process is a really, really important process at, the, uh, at, a, at any airline, because any inefficiency in this uh, process can lead to delays in the flight schedule. Delays in the flight schedules, of course, make customers unhappy because we don't want to um, arrive late on time at our destination. And Lufthansa City Line has specifically looked at these ground operations processes because, of course, um, these are the processes where you really can have an impact. When you're in the air and looking at the processes while you're flying, of course, you cannot change much about the weather, right? So therefore, they had a closer look at the ground operations, and this process basically consists of every step between the landing of an airplane until it is taking off in the air again. And this includes the transport of the crew and passengers, the fueling of the plane, the cleaning of the plane, as well as the re-catering of it, unloading and loading packages, boarding and deboarding, as well as the pushback of the plane. As I already mentioned, this is not a typical process that we usually analyze. And it is very different from typical supply chain processes that we have, an order to cash process. And this comes along with the data availability of it. So how can you actually collect data that is happening all out there on the airplane? Uh, at the, uh, at the so, how can you, um, so how can you actually collect data that is not, not manually typed in, not directly stored in systems? So this is what Lufthansa City Line did in the next step by using AI activity tracking based on video footage uh, where they have actually uh, followed around different carriers, different vehicles, like the baggage car, the pushback vehicle, the luggage truck, and created timestamps based on the motion of these different vehicles. They've also made use of sensors that were put onto, for example, the doors, where they could measure once the door closed, when the, when the airplane was ready for takeoff, as well as on the pushback vehicle, which is the last instance that is touching the airplane before it actually takes off. And with the help of these kinds of AI activity tracking measurements, they were able to create an event log just like we have known it and seen it before. And based on this event log, they were able to reconstruct the process as it really happened on the ground and also divide this into several sub-processes and measure the punctuality of the sub-process as well, like the cleaning process, the fueling process, the loading process, to eventually figure out where can they actually improve. And this process mining project at Lufthansa City Line was conducted or initiated by the so-called PROMOTE initiative, the Process Mining for Operational Excellence initiative, 
that really had its focus or business objectives on better punctuality and reliability of the airplanes. The results were that 17% of the flights, uh, the results were that 17% more flights were able to depart on time meaning less delays were enabled by eliminating so-called first flight process issues. So issues that ha are happening on the first flight of the day, usually they carry over to the next flights and mess up the complete uh, flight schedule for this day. They were also able to improve the ranking in the OAG's punctuality report and with that also increase their customer satisfaction rating so all in all, they were really able to improve the maintenance, maintenance and tool transfers and minimize their long aircraft on ground times for faster takeoff. So all that remains left for us to say is thank you. Thanks for listening to this lecture. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you will go out and think about where you know, you've experienced inefficient processes, maybe where process mining is already part of your customer experience or um, our daily work life. So maybe we also experience good processes now. Um, we hope we could give you a quick insight and thank you very much for staying on and for listening. Um, my name is Angela again from the Academic Alliance. With me is my colleague Anne. <laughs> um, take care. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.